Hi, my name is Stephen Heron. You're watching Town Meeting TV. Today in our studio, we have Mark Stewart Greenstein, independent candidate running for the United States Senate, to talk about um, his candidacy. Mark, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, let's just jump into it. Mark, what interests you in running for Senate? Ending Marxism. Mm -hmm. And Vermont's senior senator is a good man mm -hmm. who is also the marquee of Marxism. Mm -hmm. He is the most recognized nationally in our lifetime for, I'll put it a different way, forced socialism. Mm -hmm. Bernie calls it socialism, which sounds very nice. But when you get down to it, if the government is the one making labor regulations, making pension regulations, making health care regulations, making guidelines for housing, mm -hmm. it's force. And people need to recognize, especially progressives, what government force ultimately does. Because if you disagree and don't want to follow their, wor their wage and hour law because you have a better working relationship, there are men with guns from the government pointed at you. That's the consequence of bigger and bigger government reliance. I'm a candidate, and I think almost everyone here, even progressives, would rather see community reliance that's not government force. I'm from Connecticut. Mm -hmm. I made the journey to be a Vermonter mm -hmm. so that I could run against Senator Sanders. It's the, when you have 90 years of more and more reliance on government that's gone wayward, and Stephen, they do almost nothing right. You know, e e even the, 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 the biggest progressives within government will admit, yeah, they, they, they messed up here. That's unfair there. There are people left out of the policies. That's inherent in big government. Small government, I'm not anti any local ordinances because Burlington knows its citizens well. Barry knows its citizens well. And they're different from Shelburne or Rutland. Let them govern where the consent is so much tighter, where the needs are better addressed. The federal government can't address needs and it's done very bad for Vermont. You know how bigness has permeated over the last 20 years. The Biden administration has made things bigger and bigger. Their ties to big corporations, Wall Street, Pfizer, big tech. And with it, where do jobs, the best jobs, they don't stay in Vermont, do they? They are going to big cities. We can't compete when the government is basically responsible for Wall Street's rise, big corporations rise, and small Vermont, which has lots of talented people, has a hard time keeping them here. Okay. Now, you, you mentioned you're from Connecticut originally, yeah. and Vermont definitely has its fair share of uh, transplants, full transparency, myself included. Yeah, we almost you, all are. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, did you really run, uh, move to Vermont specifically for the purpose of running against yes. Senator Sanders? Yeah. I, I, yeah, I've been in Connecticut most of my life. Mm -hmm. I skied in Vermont. Yeah. I, uh, camped in Vermont. I know Vermont people pretty well. Okay, the residency requirement is a federal thing. Yep. But I wish 50 people were on the ballot against Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm. Come on up because he deserves people's real thoughts shorn of party. Okay, the Democrats command and tend to be Gonna, getting tons of votes. I'm unlikely to dislodge Senator Sanders. I think he's going back to the Senate. But it would be very good if I, and there's four other candidates challenging him, if we independents had 10% of the vote. Vote the way you feel. Vote the way you feel. Bernie's going to get reelected to the Senate. But if it's not with a majority, maybe it's a plurality only. Maybe this is 43%. And if 57% of Vermont is saying, we're not into this big forced socialism, that's a national rollback. I'm happy to be part of it. I wish more candidates would come on up. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, for the ones here, you who like 
a certain issue. There's someone, she's not on the ballot, but she's pretty fervent about marijuana rights. Mm -hmm. If that's a big deal to you, yeah. shear off the party allegiance mm -hmm. and vote your conscience. So yeah, coming up from Connecticut is worthy. Mm -hmm. Look, I'm likely to be staying here. I like it. I expect to be working at Stowe, where I love snowboarding and skiing, so I'm here for a while. But um, recognize the draw of your senior senator is what compels this candidate. I'm a libertarian, okay? Libertarian principles help every one of the things that he's interested in. Mr. Sanders chairs a committee that's uh, acronym is HELP. Health, education, labor, pensions. Every one of those things are done better for workers, for retirees, for uh, people who need better health care than with the government involved. Think about the way we educated where nobody was left behind in the 1870s. Health care leaves a lot of people behind still and everyone pays for it. Pensions are probably best produced without, without the federal involvement that forces employers to set aside certain things and if they go bankrupt then we're stuck. Private plans can work fine. We need the liberty-minded impulse, not the staunch Democrat impulse. Mm -hmm. Just for the sake of transparency, but I believe I know what you're talking about. In terms of the candidacy for the United States Senate, I believe that Senators, Senator Sanders is also listed as an independent. He runs. Technically, yes. He He's runs the as a nominee Democrat. of the Democrat Party. Yes, uh, and runs under the Democratic Party uh, for his presidential campaigns. But I, I believe what you're saying is primarily as, as the incumbent, as the senior most senator within the state of Vermont, and an overall cultural allegiance rather than specifically one Absolutely. particular party. And look, the contention that we conservatarians, I call myself that, conservative plus libertarian, have is against the, at this point, very manipulative Democrat leaders. And I say manipulative because they say things that even they don't believe in. A Green New Deal is not doable, and every U.S. senator knows that. Thirteen sexes. No, there are two, and every U.S. senator knows that, but they have interest groups behind them that like perpetuating things. Policies that are giving a lot more benefit to big corporations and still not letting workers rise. These come from the Biden administration, and no elected official, no elected Democrat, I should say, has been opposed. Bernie used to have a very good voice, and he still has a great audience. He's not using it. He's not. In 2016, what he put forth properly resonated. But for the last four and a half years, after losing in the primaries to Biden, he has joined the, I'm going to call it a cabal, of those in power who reward small groups that they like and leave the rest of us out. I want to think. I want to take things a little more broad strokes. I, I want to delve into your background a little bit. Sure. Has politics always been something you've been very engaged with or no. interested in, <laughs> or is it something that you've grown to to feel a, an inherent need to it's be involved? It's about, with? and you said it right. Inherent is kind of now a ten-year impulse. Uh, Twenty fourteen, I started doing a few podcasts. Twenty sixteen, I did run for office, um, not to win, but also to hopefully dislodge. Now, in 2006, I ran for office not to win also for dislodge. The candidate was somebody also running for U.S. Senate as an incumbent. Her name was Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. I didn't get very far. Um, but that was really the first foray. I've run for other offices and yes, somebody called me a heat-seeking missile. Bigger, ultimately should be better. And I was on the ballot earlier this year against Joe Biden because I was a registered Democrat who still believes that Biden and most elected Democrats have abandoned what traditional Democrats want. So um, you can look it up, the March 5th results, I came in fourth. It was a distant fourth, but it was fourth here in Vermont. What, in, what specifically stirred this 10-year this 
interest in, in dislodging or, or this sort of 20-year interest in dislodging or disrupting or just trying to make a statement, it seems more like? I'd say liberty and justice. Mm -hmm. um, the unfairness of so many things rankles the unfairness that could be turned around easily because it's in government's control. There's some things that you might call unfair about capitalist system or unfair about how you were born, where you were born. We can't fix that. We can't fix greed, which may or may not lead to unfairness. I generally think capitalism is the best way to mute greed, that it pits greed against greed and gives us better products, lower prices, better employment. We can't fix those inherent things. Government can be fixed in almost an instant. Stephen, we've built up for 90 years, since the 1930s, a government response to almost everything that ails us. And over the last, I'll say, 20 years, eh, 15 years, almost everything that we feel is bad. They want to legislate. Legislate with thought and in my idea with the constitutional bounds because our constitution really doesn't give the government more than 18 very constrained powers. I think you know that comes from Article 1, Section 8. Congress technically is not allowed to do Obamacare. Congress technically is not allowed to do Social Security. I'm okay with having a con constitutional amendment if that's really what we now want, but before we do that, how about investigating the private way that we can take private care of ourselves, that we can take private health care, private pension care, that labor relations can be done very well, enforced by courts, got to have that, libertarians still want courts, and employment. Libertarians still would like to see penalties for people who knowingly operate unsafe workplaces. And if somebody loses an arm, there better be compensation to that person. And in the process, make them safer even before somebody loses an arm. So with justice and with charity, which Americans have an abundant amount of, with charity, those two things replace most government programs. Is there anything that drew you to Vermont in particular outside of political interests? You're a happy place. And I noticed that because I helped another candidate just to get on the ballot. I went up to Brattleboro. Mm -hmm. And to get on the ballot for U.S. president, um, you need 1,000 signatures of Vermont voters. For U.S. Senate, it's 500. I was helping him get to his 500. And remarkably, the way to do it is no longer really going door to door. That's kind of creepy, so you've got to go to more public places. If you saw me outside the, the Price Chopper, um, that's, that's where I got an awful lot of signatures. Thank you, Price Chopper in Brattleboro. The, the, um, the beautiful um, thing is you get into other conversations. People in Brattleboro, and I'm finding it here in Burlington, they love it. It's a very happy place, despite it being a tough place, okay? You have weather, you have high prices, and you don't have great employment opportunities. We know this. I'm not saying anything out of line. So despite that, nobody wants to leave. Here, by contrast, Connecticut, when I went to ask people to get on the ballot, that was for myself, I got 7,700 signatures. So I talked to an awful lot of people. I'm gonna estimate about a quarter would tell me, yeah, I'm out of here soon. When my kid graduates high school, we're going to North Carolina. Or as soon as I turn 65, I can't wait to get out of here. I heard one such comment in all of Brattleboro. Yeah. It's a nice thing. It's very nice thing. Yeah. Is there anything from your personal experience that you believe that you could bring to the office of the United States Senate? Yes, yeah. a lot. Now, I'll take away from the personal experience because I haven't held elective office. Mm -hmm. I have a small business, really two. I have a small real estate business and a slightly larger tutoring business. So they've been run for 16 and 24 years respectively. So we've, we've done okay. Now, the ideas that I bring, which are not mine, call them Thomas Jefferson's ideas and others who have 
unfortunately not been elected since Jefferson, <laughs> but the ideas that if I were elected would be in play radically changes things. I'm saying three and out from three years and done for many programs. Example, every federal regulation not introduced by Congress should be taken out. Either, I don't know if you can physically rip up the regulation, mm -hmm. but a president can say we're not enforcing it, or a U.S. Congress can say we don't anymore want this in play. Regulations come from Congress punting to bureaucrats, which is very bad because Congress was elected. So at least there's some tether to a Congress who would say or could be unelected because of it. When they punt to unelected bureaucrats who might not be any wiser, who may be politically influenced by businesses and other special groups, there is no longer any tether to what the people want. Eliminate every federal regulation, start again. Leave it to the laws that Congress has passed. And even then, if those are unconstitutional, they violate Article One, Section 8, I think you look again about reforming those laws or passing a constitutional amendment. People say, hey, if you got elected, what party would you caucus with? Answer, probably neither. I think the, I'll call them Republicrats, the combination of not the far right, but the modest Nikki Haley right, and most elected Democrats, not the far left, that monoparty, uniparty, some people say, is governing without the best regard. Somebody who's been elected for being an outsider, I mean, that's the reason I have clout. I'm not gonna get elected because I speak well or handsome or have a good resume. I don't. If elected one of these days, unlikely this round, it's because of bringing good ideas. And if 50% of the state of Vermont said, these are good ideas, we need to end wokeness. We need to finally put an end to the statism that's coming up. And we just elected this nobody. You can call me a nobody. We just out of nowhere elected somebody bringing back old ideas for good modernity. He has clout. And hopefully this happens in 49 other states too. I would love to be a pace setter for others and then I'm happy to go away. I don't even want to serve a full six years. Here's what I'd love. I'd like to be elected, serve two of those years. The governor then calls for a special election for another successor. Vermont will have another senator, maybe it'll be Mr. Malloy, for four more years and he can run again. What will I do? Go to a neighboring state and do the same thing in maybe Massachusetts or maybe Rhode Island because they too are deep blue, governed by, I think, the wrong principles, especially if you're a traditional Democrat, your deep blue representatives are not representing you anymore. I want to elaborate on some of some of the ideas that you spoke. Is what are some of the the challenges or the benefits that you feel that you face as an independent candidate in general and not associated with not only a major party but also even a notable fringe party? Well, here's the benefit for voters. It's a great question. I've done 15 interviews in my career. This is tops. <laughs> Thank you. One of the benefits to voters is that you're voting for and maybe electing somebody who has no party ties. I take no donations. So there is no individual donor who's going to be influencing me. There's no party orthodoxy that says, ooh, you should be doing this and we're not going to support you. If I'm in Congress, I'm my own drummer with people behind me, the voters behind me who have disdain at that point for how business is getting done. So that would be a colossal benefit. I think there's a benefit to a strong third party as well. Now I call 
epic a party. It's literally just me and a few would-be candidates for 2026. EPIC stands, by the way, for Every Politically Independent Citizen, E-P-I-C, and we are on, online with some would-be candidates. It'd be nice if there was a strong third or fourth party, I'd say third and fourth, because when I hear a bipartisan compromise between Republicans and Democrats, I think there's a sellout somewhere. It's that uniparty that I was talking about. A third strong party also does this for campaigning. No mudslinging, or very little. Because when one guy has only one other opponent, going negative works. Absolutely. Going negative, it's nasty, but it tends to bring down the other guy. If you go negative in a three-way race against one other person, you yourself get besmirched, and the third person is uplifted. So that's a good civics thing. Downside? Well, it's media, because you are among the few who want to cover candidates who almost certainly don't have a chance to win, but candidates who could influence. Good for you, but corporate media does not see it that way. In fact, they used to publicize election results routinely of the five top people, okay? Now you see just the top two. They seem on re election reporting to only do the Republican and the Democrat unless some third party somehow gets into the 20% range and they'll put them in yellow or something. So big downside is the lack of party recognition, their media recognition. And yes, big parties have support. I don't have volunteers coming out to say, hey, we'll put down yard signs. I have some. I and one other person are, are putting out those signs. You can have one. Look at StuartForLiberty.com. We'll get you one. What we do have is a fervent, real candidate. I write every single piece. I do videos myself. I don't have a spokesperson. Is that a downer? I don't know. I make mistakes. It's not nearly as polished, but it's real. So again, I think for the voters, the rise of independence is a very good thing for themselves and for democracy. Is there anything you've learned across this experience in your in your the number of campaigns that you've done in the past 18 years or so that has changed or evolved your perspective of the American political system? No. And and that's because I believe too many things haven't been tried well. I've always done this within the independent system. I've made many mistakes. Haven't gotten much traction in any one race. The one that I actually didn't expect to get many votes, I mean, I thought double digits. That's all I was going to get back in March. Because I was in this state for all of four days putting out a few signs. I had no media interviews. I had no newspaper, no television, no paid advertisements. We weren't on any social media. And yet, I got almost 800 votes. And I had met maybe a total of 50 people. So that was surprising on the upside. The downside campaigns have been not surprising. Um, but I can't say I've learned from it because you're an independent. You're not supposed to do well. So the thing that I would love to see is an open-mindedness by voters that voting your conscience actually is the highest form of vote. Now, especially in an all-blue state, okay? At the presidential level, we know that this state is going to not vote for Trump, okay? We know that. So at the presidential level, if there's a third party candidate, you're not going to keep Kamala from winning by voting third party. I'll say the same thing probably in even my race. Bernie's going to win again. Okay, he's going to. But that gives you, in a way, license to vote for a third party who you believe in. Or even if you don't like me, you believe in the elevation of third parties. Um, so things become more robust. If we had four robust candidates, we could have debates of our own. And if Bernie didn't want to show, they'd still have an awful lot of issues. It would be me times three more. 
But when everyone is subdued to, eh, it's going to be a Republican or a Democrat and that's it, it's a shame. It can change on a dime. Voters really do have the power to use their third party inclinations or independent inclinations. People say they like independence. Well, here is one. Many people, this is so unfortunate, wouldn't sign a petition because they're fed up with the whole system. Mm -hmm. Now, that's absolutely a voter who should be voting third party. Mm -hmm. The system is the two big parties. If you just don't show up and vote, you're, in a way, you've been cowed and you show it. When you show up and vote for someone other than Republican and Democrat, you then assert some power and it's in your direction. It might not happen right away, but the only way that two-party system can become less dominant is when you have a third, maybe a fourth, robust set of candidates. Mark, we're, we're running out of time, but I want to want to thank you. Uh, to close out the show, is there anything particular that you feel would be encouraging to candidates, even if they don't vote for an independent tar party, to not be discouraged by the system as it exists now, or if there's a way that they feel that they can be more engaged and potentially change it? I will give away. Um, that that way is to use the social media power that almost everybody has. And to the extent that you have 40 followers who at least read your stuff, maybe you don't convince them, but if even five of them vote your way and you encourage them to tell 40 others and even five of them vote your way, let's go a couple more deep. What is five to the fifth? It's a big number, okay? I believe it's 3,100, okay? That's a significant number in a small state, okay? There'll only be about 180,000 votes for U.S. Senate. 3,000 of them for a nobody that you believe in and five to the fifth voters also believe in becomes a pretty powerful message. So voters, if they would use the new power, broadcast networks, used to be the only way to go. And unfortunately, we're not, as voters, using our social media as well as we should. And I actually believe that the sort of taboo, ooh, don't talk politics at the workplace. Don't even talk about social issues at Thanksgiving. That's, it's coming from incumbents, or incumbents at least like that. Because if we're not talking about any challenges, there won't be any strong challenges. Do talk at the water cooler. Do mention it to the other moms who are at the soccer game that you're attending with them. Talk about civics because, Stephen, they're running your lives. More and more, the federal plus the state is running your lives, and I contend that they're running it generally badly. It is worth talking so that you have the chance to dislodge those who are running it in not the ways you want. Mark, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your time. Folks, thank you for watching Town Meeting TV. This has been a discussion with Mark Stewart Greenstein. To find more of our related content, visit cctv.org. Thank you for watching.